Courtney and Michael McKay, and with a special introduction and welcome from Professor Richard Croker and Elder Dr. Albert Marshall. Colleagues, I want to acknowledge that today I'm standing at, in, uh, at Dalhousie University, which is located in Mi'kma'ki. Uh, Mi'kma'ki is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. I'm especially pleased today to welcome Michael McKay from the Nishwabi Aski Nation and Dr. Sheila McCartney from the Together Design Lab at the University of Metropolitan University. Oh, sorry, the Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, through partnership, uh, Michael and Dr. McCartney have developed the NAN housing strategy and many of its supporting projects. McKay and McCartney will speak today about the systems that have led to on-reserve housing conditions in Canada, housing as a central community health and innovative research being undertaken to support the development of the NAN housing strategy. They will ground this work through discussions of how their partnership was built, its many successes, and their vision for Indigenous housing and for Indigenous resurgence in housing. I'd also like to acknowledge that today's event was made possible through the funding by the Winters Endowment. Established by Mrs. Winters in memory of her former husband um, mem and member of the House of Commons, Robert Winters, this fund supports high profile speakers like Mike and Sheila through public lectures in architecture, planning and engineering. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Winters family for their generous support in bringing these relevant and important topics to our community. Now, just for a, a few housekeeping uh, messages before we get on with the program, I'm sure many colleagues on the line are very familiar with Zoom and its technologies. And I just wanna make sure we have a clear uh, understanding of how we're using uh, this technology today. Uh, during the lecture, um, attendees won't be able to unmute themselves. Um, in the middle of the menu bar, you'll find a chat function we have modified uh, the chat function for this event. Messages sent there will go, uh, will not go directly to our speakers, um, but they will um, go to our tech support uh, for processing. And if you're having any difficulty with uh, the chat function, please message Anne or Melissa, uh, whose uh, names and uh, contact information are at the top of the invite. We've also auto-generated captions today. They are currently on to activate or deactivate the captions, click on the triangle to the right of the CC Live transcript option. Click on to hide or show the subtitle. This will only affect your uh, viewing. Finally, we'll be recording the introduction of our speakers and the presentation por portion of this event. Upon conclusion of the presentation, we will turn off the recording for a question and answer period. During the question and answer period, please uh, message Dr. Lisa Berglund uh, through the chat uh, to ensure that your question is uh, in a queue and we will do our best to uh, address as many questions that are uh, put in the chat function today. So uh, without further ado, I will now go to uh, people that uh, we would love to hear from today. So first, I'd like to introduce um, Elder Dr. Albert Marshall and Professor Emeritus Richard Croker. Both of us, these um, scholars have established a partnership committed to building relationships and supporting communities through design work in Mi'kma'ki. Elder Dr. Uh, excuse me, Elder Dr. Albert Marshall is a Mi'kmaq member of the Moose Clan from the community of Eskasoni. As a young boy, Dr. Marshall was forcefully taken from his family in Eskasoni, Unamaki, Cape Breton. And he spent many years as an inmate of the Shubenacadie Residential School in mainland Nova Scotia. 
Isolated from his family under a system where education was an instrument of cultural genocide, this experience had a profound effect on Dr. Marshall and has led him on a quest to understand the culture from which he was removed and the culture upon which was forced upon him. It has been a lifelong task to find ways where such different cultures can meet in a place of mutual respect. Elder Marshall is a passionate advocate for two-eyed seeing, drawing attention to its deep origins um, within Mi'kmaq culture, where it emerged amongst the Aboriginal people of North America with the longest experience living beside European newcomers. Elder Marshall continues to work tirelessly to bring two-eyed seeing to bear on diverse projects regionally, nationally, and internationally. Bringing together indigenous understanding and ways of knowing with mainstream knowledge and knowledge systems for the collective benefit of the whole community and all of us within it. Elder Marshall has been a tireless advocate for collective environment. He was a key participant, excuse me, he was a key participant with 23 other elders from Mi'kmaq and Wulistwik, Inu and Inuit communities in Atlantic Canada within the Atlantic Policy Congress of First Nation Chiefs to bring forward eight recommendations on the appropriate consultation of elders on all aspects of health, education, law, and matters pertaining to the wider environment and our responsibilities within it. Elder Marshall acts as a teacher, an advisor, and a mentor at a number of universities across Canada and internationally, including acting as an elder advisor to Native Engineering Student Society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, advisory work at Humber College at the University of Toronto, Trent University, the University of New Brunswick, Cape Breton University, Acadia University, and as well, his long involvement with the School of Architecture here at Dalhousie University. Wolaylan Albert Marshall. I'd now like to introduce uh, Professor Richard Croker from the School of Architecture. Richard is a widely recognized, um, valued, unique mentor and leader within the architectural community across, in, in Nova Scotia and across Canada. His passion for creating beautiful and meaningful buildings for the communities he works with, particularly Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia, have produced remarkably sensitive projects that are intimately tied to place and culture. His approach to working with Indigenous leaders and elders and the ability of his buildings to uh, nurture the development of modern Indigenous identity has been pivotal inspiration for countless students teachers and practitioners of architecture. Richard's active engagement in the architectural community of Nova Scotia as a professor, a mentor, and a practitioner has earned him the great respect of his peers, students, and his clients. He is a tremendous architect, an amazing human being, and a true asset for the culture of our school of architecture, our community at Dalhousie, and the broader Nova Scotian community. Uh, colleagues, I'm delighted that uh, Elder Marshall and Professor Croker are here to welcome our guests. And I will now turn the floor to Professor Croker and Elder Albert Marshall. Thank you. Malalan. Thank you, Dean Gagnon. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really thrilled to be able to uh, hear Dr. McCartney and, and Michael McKay talk about their work in uh, Anishinaabe country. Um, for many years, uh, we've been looking to, to increase the collaboration between indigenous communities and universities. It, it makes a, a, a great deal of sense. Since I came to Mi'kmaq and uh, made connection with, with uh, people in Mi'kmaq and also took an interest in the design traditions, it occurred to me that um, a lot of what I was seeing in terms of history of, uh, of making things was firmly rooted in, in a kind of what I would call scientific thinking, but not from a, kind, a fragmented point of view, but an integrated point of view. And uh, 
ultimately, I think um, Albert has articulated it best when he he uh, found the Mi'kmaq word, or he and he and Merdina found the, the Mi'kmaq word at Wapmunk. And maybe uh, I'll ask Albert to, to, to uh, talk a bit more about that because I think um, he's really captured uh, uh, the sense of what that means and what it could mean both for in indigenous knowledge and also for, for the university. Thank you, Richard. In our language, it's so complete. And we use that word Edwapton. And if we're going to be talking about knowledge, again, we would have to say the Ordem and the Kijida. Now, to find a concept from another language, it's not, not really impossible, but it's very, very difficult. Okay. That concept would, would not really capture the true essence of what that word implies. Because it's, it is so complete, but yet, since evolution is inevitable, we now have to embrace the spirit of co learning. But before co-learning can begin, we need champions. A champion in which could, I could, could, liter, could literally view from an Aboriginal, from an Aboriginal lens of what, we, of, of what we see. Because in theory alone, people will not capture not just the issue, but the problems. And when I invoke my two eyes, it takes a lot of, lot of energy to keep cultivating hope, innovation and experimentation when you're under the regime, when, the, when, when you're under the apartheid regime. But two I see, and again, you know, I you know, the fundamental principle as, as I see it is, it should be a guide, it is a guiding principle as to how we go through life. In which in this case here, we try to promote the idea of co-learning, learning from the learning from the mainstream. And hopefully the mainstream will learn from us as well. Only then, I believe, people will begin to peek through our Aboriginal land. Actually, the state of the state of the situation, especially when it comes to housing, they can clearly see that why, in this day of age, people would not not just not just any group, the original people of this country. Why are they living in such a state? in which these things are not, are not nowhere near standard of what everybody else enjoys. But yet, we are, or we were, we are the original people of this country. But yet, we don't see too much of that benefit that everyone else has. So for us to, to come together and begin to craft another narrative in which the outcome of that would be we're going to, everything has to be done to bring these issues forward in which no one, and I mean no one, should be subjected to this dire situation, especially in living, living conditions. So to I see into me, I think again, if we if it's em if it's embraced and, and, and accepted, it has to be it has to become action oriented. 
There's no sense looking at a problem and do, and do, not, and do not come up with a, with a solution to it. But the solution in this case here, I think has to be done collectively on, on a spirit of co-learning. We, we now have to exist in these two worlds. Our, our world is not redundant, but yet, you know, it, it's, part of, it's part of our evolution. In which we, you know, we should we we should be living coexisting, co-learning, whoever whoever we need to learn from. So to I see and again, I think has to be action oriented. Thank you. And so with that, um, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, welcome uh, our guests. To, uh, to, the, to this talk, and uh, I'll turn it over back to Dean Canyon. Richard, I appreciate this. Uh, welcome, and um, Elder Marshall, I appreciate uh, your words to start off this, this lecture today. I think it, they're invaluable. I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, good friend, uh, Dr. Lisa Berglund. Uh, Dr. Berglund is an assistant professor in the School of Planning, and she is also the chair of our faculty's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. Uh, I'd really like to acknowledge Dr. Berglund's efforts and ideas in creating this uh, lecture for today, and I will uh, would uh, call on Dr. Berglund to introduce our speakers. So, Lisa. Great, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, so I have the pleasure today of uh, introducing our guests, Dr. Sheila McCartney and Michael McKay. Uh, Michael McKay is the Infrastructure and Housing Director at the Anishinaabe Aski Nation, which is a political territorial organization that represents 49 First Nation communities within Northern Ontario. And he's been in the field of infrastructure and housing since 2000. And Michael is originally from the Bearskin Lake First Nation, which is a member of the Anishinaabe Aski First Nation. And he received an advanced diploma for architectural technology from the Confederation College in Thunder Bay. And Dr. Sheila McCartney is a licensed architect and urbanist specializing in marginalized community development and housing. She is an associate professor at the School of Urban and Regional Planning at the freshly renamed Toronto Metropolitan University. And she's the director of Together Design Lab, which is an innovative research and design lab that explores platforms that focus on contemporary interdisciplinary approaches to community and open territory to design. She has a bachelor, she has bachelor's degrees in environmental studies and professional architecture from the University of Waterloo. And she is also a Fulbright scholar. And she holds a master, de, master of design studies and doctorate of design from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Um, before I hand it over to Mike and Sheila for, for their presentation, I do wanna just remind you as Graham said earlier that um, the presentation is gonna be followed by a question and answer period. So any questions, that you would like us to ask um, our esteemed presenters here um, can be sent to me in a direct message. Again, my name is Lisa Berglund, so you can put that in the chat, just select me and send me a, a direct message with any of your questions and we'll pass that along to the presenters in the question and answer period. So I will turn it over to Sheila and Mike. Uh, thanks so much uh, to you both for the introduction. I'll just share my screen and then we'll begin. So today I stand in Toronto located in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to the share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. And the land Mike stands on today is the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation, signatory of the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. We acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. 
Today, we're going to be talking about the Anishinaabeaski Nation housing strategy and the work being undertaken to support its development. We're going to give a very brief overview of the on reserve housing and how the current housing emergency came to be, the role of shared values and understandings in our partnership, and how it translates into the work that we do. And as an example of this, we will focus on one of our youth housing projects, a home of our own, and how it was developed and the project learnings. We will then zoom out to demonstrate how our experiences working together and with youth from the Anishinaabeaski Nation Territory can offer lessons on an alternative form of practice that supports First Nations self-determination and housing systems. And finally, we're going to reflect on the, how these lessons can influence the ways each of you can move forward as professionals and as Canadians. Thank you, Sheila. Um, so Anishinaabeaski Nation is a, uh, is a political territorial organization that uh, represents 49 First Nations. 33 of those First Nations are fly-in only without year-round road access. Uh, we have approximately four, 45,000 members that live on and off reserve. Uh, the NAN territory covers 543,000 square kilometers. Um, as you can see from the map here, it's it uh, along the Manitoba border, Hudson Bay and James Bay to the Quebec border. So it's a large area. Uh, NAN encompasses treaty number nine and parts of treaty number five. We also have a four language groups, Oji Cree, Ojibwe Cree and Algonquin. Next slide, thank you. So these images characterize the low lying landscape of many NAN communities. That is just, uh, I think that that picture was taken in um, Attawapiskat, one of the NAN First Nations. And the, uh, the second picture there, the second image is uh, uh, just a, a picture of the one image of, of a home in kind of a deteriorating state uh, where many uh, First Nations have that uh, uh, their current housing stock is, is in that condition. So my department is a, is a small team with a diverse skill set, including architecture, engineering, uh, waste management experience, fire prevention and emergency management. With proven successes working in a, uh, working at a community level to implement projects uh, valued at approximately 15 to 20 million, we are experienced with the many challenges of working in a remote fly-in setting. Some winter road access uh, is only three months of the year with the, but depleting with climate change and the rest of the year only being fly-in. We have multiple ongoing partnerships with uh, communities, tribal councils, and a variety of uh, funding agencies. Uh, so when we think about Together Design Lab, we're an interdisciplinary team of planning and architecture with many long-term members that are part of the team that are about five plus years as part of our Together Design Lab. We specialize in appropriate and immersive engagement activities, full housing systems experience from design to governance and strategy. And also all of our work focuses on partnership. Our research work happens because our partners identify challenges issues or barriers that they face in their housing system. And through action-oriented work, we look to support their building of their solutions. I think there's some uh, key words there that the partners identify the challenges. Uh, they come to us, we speak with people about them, and then we work to support their supports. We're not looking uh, to do research in a particular way. So why the NAN housing strategy? In 2014, the NAN Chiefs and Assembly collectively declared a NAN-wide housing state of emergency. This de declaration came as a result of decades of inappropriate intervention and led the Chiefs to describe the conditions being faced in their communities as deplorable 
and leading to extensive health issues, short housing life, overcrowding, and extreme mold. Four years later, in 2018, facing continued widespread housing insecurity, the NAN Chiefs and Assembly reasserted the emergency, adding the existing st standard housing solutions have not met immediate need, have not addressed future need, and have not promoted or created wellness in the communities and mandated, mandated the creation of the, of the NAN housing strategy, which was to focus on community-based understandings of housing need and be rooted in local solutions. Next slide. I, I've pressed it, it's just taking a couple minutes to go, I don't know why. Okay. Um, Mike, why don't you continue and I'll stop the share for a second and try to bring up a smaller file. So, okay, I'll just continue. Um, so the NAN housing strategy goals, um, falling under the strategy's vision to fulfill the human right of access to adequate housing and end and the collective housing emergency in the Anishinaabe Aski Nation territory. Our four interrelated goals. The first goal is create inclusive, occupant-focused uh, housing needs assessment tools and support the creation of community-based long-term housing and infrastructure plans. The second goal is vision appropriate housing and community designs to match the diverse needs within NAN communities. The third one is to create experimental uh, educational opportunities, support professional development, establish skills training programs, and encourage inter-community mentorship programs in housing related fields. The fourth goal is to develop policy alternatives to identifying opportunities in government an agency program and policy, and also alternative funding mechanisms. So we're considering this very brief history. We need to think of the policy framework of the Indian Act and what it has to do with housing. So I wanna take a moment to explore the historical roots of the ongoing housing emergency being phrased in NAN territory. First, in 1876, the Indian Act and its subsequent revisions are still enshrined in law and set in place in a paternalistic hierarchy that regulates First Nations peoples to being wards of the government. In section three, sorry, in section 1.3 of the Indian Act, in, an Indian reserve is land held by the Crown for the use and benefit of the respective bands for which they are set apart. So the First Nations, this is not their territory. This has meant that First Nations people nor First Nations bands owned the land reserved for them and they had occupancy relationship to their reserves. Section 30 of the Interim Act gave Parliament the authority to determine who was permitted to live in the houses and even in some cases the authority to restrict access to reserve land through the use of a pass system. Hunters and families were not allowed to leave their land for longer than six days. And so then this would mean that if it took three days to get to traditional trap lines and food sources, they wouldn't have time to make it back and thus must stay on the reserve uh, rather than being able to be um, individuals and pursuing their cultural means of feeding themselves and their economies at the time. The Indian Act placed government officials or so-called Indian agents in the control of managing day-to-day -day lives of First Nations people. In housing, this meant that they had control over the land what would be built on it and acting as a de facto construction supervisors and pr uh, property managers. So what it means to work in this policy framework is that the paternalized system interfered with the ability to pursue traditional ways of life and provide for families since time immemorial. Families were forced to settle permanently in areas they may previously have traded in and dictated by Indian agents. And these were the locations that were not always ideal sites for community development, due to geographic constraints, such as low-lying marshlands that would have been great to trade on, but wouldn't have been great places to live. 
peninsulas or islands, and also family groupings being broken up because they had gone to other locations to trade where they would not necessarily have lived together. Previous ways of living were then further impacted by the removal of children from families through the residential school system, and that housing built in these communities through early on reserve programs was immediately documented to be insufficient in quantity and quality and inappropriate for the cultural, climactic, and geographic context. Cont context sorry. So decades of top-down intervention have followed therein housing models from southern suburban Canada been implemented across the on-reserve near north. While these imposed models of housing have been inappropriate, chronic underfunding has meant that housing has always outpaced the development sorry, housing need has always outpaced the development and created ever-expanding shortages and crowding that continue to expand. Since the 1980s, formal policies have shifted towards the, lang the language of giving back or giving back responsibility for housings in First Nations, but without the adequate provision of resources and recognition of First Nation treaty rights. So why the NAN housing strategy? In thinking about addressing the housing emergency declared by the chiefs through a strategy, we placed a large importance on the idea of being community-based. While it has certainly become popular to say that projects are community-based or grassroots, we wanted to take the time to explore what would this really mean for a housing strategy? How could a project taking a place across a, such a large regional territory and with so many people truly be community-based? And how could such a project that spans the entire housing system be rooted in lived experiences of all community members. Each of the activities we designed looked to address each of these questions. And while we may not always achieve lofty goals we set for ourselves, we try to revisit these questions regularly. So the foundation of our partnership is based on shared understandings of housing and shared values. What we are going to discuss today is the result of years of work and effort and communication. This, this didn't just miraculously appear and has often emerged through discussion, conversation, and looking to understand how to best work together. These discussions and this work together has led to a formalized partnership agreement, which acts as the foundation for our work together and cements our understandings of partnership and deals with the day-to-day -day outcomes like data stewardship and management. This comes years after effort and being explicit with these ideas and not avoiding difficult conversations. This model, we, this model we are creating acts as a direct counter to the status quo we are begin, beginning. We see beginning with government and extending into industry that disregards important beliefs of respect, listening, and community-led decision-making. These beliefs and the ways of working need to be central to all solutions. Approaches need to, be, need to make community-led and cultural appropriate housing to rebuild the system. First Nations are not stakeholders. They are the leaders and partners. Housing is a key social determinant of health and, and experiences of home intersect with other systems such as health, education, and justice. Buildings and the landscapes they are situated in shape who we are, who we meet and how we interact with each other. These spaces we inhabit through choice or circumstances shape us. The spaces and places on reserve are an example of deep struggles between Indigenous communities and architecture and planning as disciplines. Psychologists have demonstrated that housing is responsible for a large part of physical and mental issues in remote communities. So changing the housing and establishing positive place could be a, a key in a, to increasing wellness in these communities. Housing is an important economic opportunity on reserve and also needs to be considered as an opportunity for training and capacity development to help reduce economic leakage. So 
having trouble there again. Yeah. Here we wanted to share the uh, the NAN's uh, NAN Women's Council quote: "Decent and affordable housing is utmost to the health and well-being of Anishinaabe Aski Nation communities. Moreover." Enough dec decent and affordable housing, including alternative housing opportunities, ensures choice and increases safety for the most vulnerable people in our communities. shared values. It shouldn't be the responsibility of community members to make sure they are participating in housing strategy development. Instead, we think it should be our responsibility to be designing an engagement strategy, asking questions and building activities that are, that are relevant to community members and create a space where they feel comfortable participating. You can see on this, this slide, for us, this means everything, everything from working with youth in arenas and having lunch and learns with elders. So when we think about the project methods, the challenge in developing the NAN housing strategy is the creation of an engagement strategy that allows for members across the entire territory and with such a diverse um, diversity of experiences to participate and have their experiences shape the project's learnings. This is especially challenging given that 33 of the First Nations are accessible only by air. What we hope to have been able to accomplish is creating a model of engagement which recognizes every community has unique and valuable experience with housing. Discussion of housing should not be limited to those in positions of leadership, housing professionals, or people with technical expertise, but should be welcoming to everyone. To do this, we've looked to break down or disassemble the questions, which will ultimately make up portions of the strategy into areas of discussion or activity, which are welcoming a variety of capacities. Additionally, we've looked to create safe and open discussions by allowing for specialized sessions for children, youth, elders, and other groups identified by community partners who may prefer to participate independently. So to think of what we've done to date, to date, we've held workshops in eight First Nations. These multi-day trips allow us to work with many community groups and understand existing challenges, successes, and goals for the future. It's important context over the last couple of years, Anishinaabe Aski Nation territory has not been open uh, to people uh, traveling within the territories. And so we've begun to think about how we can centralize this discussion uh, with groups uh, over virtual connections. So in addition to community visits, the strategy relies on centralized meetings in Thunder Bay with various groups sending representatives, and this includes housing managers, health workers, women, and youth. We hope to resume in-person activities and community visits in the near future. So when we think about the general learnings involved, we've drawn some broad lessons from our NAN um, housing strategy engagement. When we think about housing needs to vary across demographic groups, youth, singles, seniors, single parents, women, 2SL, LGBTQ, youth transitioning out of care, people with disabilities, young families, to name a few. And that current policy and funding programs do not recognize the diversity of housing needs or to support the diversity of built form. So for instance, Section 95 housing, but it applies in Northern Ontario, is the same policy that applies throughout Nova Scotia. And the current policy and funding programs don't recognize this diversity. The population projections are inadequate, remoteness quotients do not reflect different levels of access, and infrastructure development is far behind. That's to say that in many areas that the maximum unit price are these policies do not take into account the extra expenses that would be required in NAN territories. And common themes emerge from the community visits, which were housing design, community growth, access to services, protecting the environment and capacity development. Increasingly, as a response to community feedback, 
we have looked to understand and conceptualize smaller housing units for the NAD territory. Three and four bedroom family sized units are the norm, and it means single people, youth, and elders are often forced to stay with others because there are no units sized appropriately for their family structure. Working together with these groups most impacted, as well as others, we have looked to identify how to most appropriately conceptualize smaller units. While many examples of tiny homes exist and are quite popular, there is a concern about their appropriateness given the climate and the and need for storage space for those who continue to pursue traditional activities. The question becomes, what is the form of a small, smaller home for NAN members? What, what does housing built specific, specifically for youth, single people, or elders looking to live alone or independently look like? And how can uh, that reflect the culture, climate, and geography of the place? We have begun to explore models of flexible spaces, which could be adapted to the changing needs of the demographics identified. Not to create stagnant spaces, but instead to recognize the potential possible needs. Here, we are going to focus on youth housing. Youth emerged as a population that are experiencing particular housing need through the engagement sessions. As a result, special projects with unique methods and objectives have been developed to meet the specific needs of youth in the region. Here I wanted to share a quote from the Ushkadzig Youth Council. It's, uh, it's, our, it's the NAN Youth Council. Housing is a priority. Every family needs to have their own space to create memories. A home of our own project. It's a project that is focused on the design of youth specific housing on reserve, identifying models of home which would meet their specific and unique needs. This project recognizes that there is a date that there is a diverse diversity of youth in the NAD territory who require a range of solutions, many which are not provided for them currently. In order to undertake this stream, design sessions have been held with youth during each community visit and a territory-wide youth events. These, se these sessions focus on understanding youth priorities in housing while recognizing that many youth have not been engaged in design activities previously. Using interactive activities and arts-based techniques, we have tried to understand how these spaces could be defined. Iterative work that goes back to participant youth where possible or to youth council to confirm learnings. Design is a central piece of the project, which will also look at governance and policy to understand how, if purpose-built youth housing was developed in communities, how could we ensure that youth are best set up to succeed in these homes? So a challenge in doing this work is trying to appropriately interpret findings from youth events and ensure that the learnings are accurately representing the goals that youth are sharing. While the work is iterative, it also cannot focus on the creation of a single prototype representative of Yan Nuuk, sorry, of Nan youth. Youth from within the territory are diverse and their specific contexts require a variety of solutions. This has been done over three years. We have hundreds of these diagrams and it's slow work that's built over time. It's important to note too that this project came out of a, a, a project working with communities to develop community-based uh, lived experience metrics within the housing system as well. So in this, the lesson is don't overgeneralize. Do not take a few data points and translate them into your worldview and consider that you have the solution to make systemic change. You need many more conversations to, in, to deepen your understanding. We used a process of interpretation and verification 
to ensure that the analysis we were reading from these sketches were indeed what the author intended. What emerges is a series of lessons, understandings, learnings that guide the development and create models that represent the needs of a diversity of youth across the territory. While recognizing that the infrastructure, geography, and resources available in each community are different, requiring different housing solutions. We've continued to develop a pilot design from feedback from youth during our youth gathering events in person in 2020 and virtually in 2021 and 2022. Our iterative process during COVID focused on deeply connecting with the youth as much as possible. So in these houses, we have a 1.5 uh, bedroom units. I think it's important to point out that similar to Nan Territory as in Nova Scotia, the section 995 housing, although you can build many different size units, it doesn't make sense with the fiscally uh, oriented uh, choice making system, let's say. So almost always four bedroom houses are made. So when we think of the 1.5 units accommodate a single youth or youth with a small child as they begin their independent housing journeys, youth are almost always left uh, off the list because they don't have large families to fill these four bedroom units. Storage place, you can also see is prioritizing, recognizing the need uh, for land-based equipment and country foods and the distances that need to be traveled to be able to secure food for the family. Units are designed for passive heat capture and for raised foundation accounts for the wet and shifting soils present in many NAN First Nations. Analysis across hundreds of drawings shows possibilities of future designs. You know, breaking, like, breaking from the normalized small house designs that place kitchen, bathroom, and sometimes a full separate bedroom under a raised loft bedroom, the analysis revealed complex notion of flexible and shared space that were desired to accommodate other youth not the youth that would necessarily be living in the house full time, but recognizing the need for the fact that youth um, would need to and want to provide housing for other youth that did not have housing. Recognizing that a youth that receives the house has the desire to house other youth that need homes within their community. So we applied the same to create a conceptual plan for the youth house, embodies complex notion of space uh, and shared space connects to the land, uses efficient design principles of a service wall, prioritizes passive energy strategies, relies on the land, not other infrastructure, which may not be built, and enables a connection to the land and community through indoor and outdoor spaces. We will look to create a modular sectioned house that can also be built with local labor or as a prefab. Youth sessions have informed the details of light quality, relationship to the outdoor circular spa circulation spaces, privacy, levels of spaces, and materiality of the spaces. Some of the details of the component parts and sustainable, sustainability measures, these cultural ideas and notions of the North are very important to the design and that building loss and funding for servicing are making it harder and harder to build houses. Funding is needed for both the house, so we need to think about low energy, low maintenance for off the grid houses, because currently the housing systems and infrastructure systems are funded completely separately. There's a diagram of the hub concept that was developed. Um, exploring youth housing has also included new siting, new sightings and infrastructure approaches to develop houses to develop houses. Responding to this lack of site servicing and infrastructure, small, small homes have to consider their footprint and integration into the limited uh, existing infrastructure. Hubs are designed to create a supportive environment for youth while maximizing building and infrastructure efficiencies. Hubs will be located to complement existing community features, adding shared space and ensuring that youth are integrated into existing social networks. Hubs contain indoor and outdoor shared spaces. The indoor space offers, ex, uh, offers a flexible programming space which can be tailored to youth needs. Programming may include skills training, education upgrading, tenant counseling, mental health program delivery, and hosting community events. 
This space was central to the shared vision by youth of not simply receiving housing, but the necessary supports required to ensure that they succeed on their own. The outdoor shared space invited community to the hub for shared meals, games, and cultural activities. Shared spaces demonstrate the project's commitment not only to building housing, but building community. So we think about some of the lessons learned from home of our own. Through working with the youth, we've drawn several key lessons. What we see here are small segment of the project learnings built off many and many, many, many youth engagements and the iterative process, which includes checking back with youth to make sure that we got the work right. It's important to recognize that you have a, to be cautious in your professional practice about how you distill learnings. You don't want to generalize. As architects, we need to move away from the translation of our worldview and knowledge systems. As architects and planners, we're taught to be solution makers, and I would encourage you all to stop rushing the solution. Recognize the limitations of our profession and potential for technical proficiency or experience to cloud opportunities for learning. Do not use your power uh, to take and harm. Wider lessons on partnership can be drawn from the development of the NAN housing strategy. First, in constantly reflecting on whose voice is being left out and how that voice can better be understood in a discussion of housing. In order to move away from a one size fits all solutions, we have to ensure that the full diversity of community members are present in discussions and that discussions are held in such a way that they feel safe participating and sharing their feelings. Housing is extremely personal and is central to both individual and well being. And is, it is only through putting members at the center of all these discussions that we can make change. Next, we continue to better understand the lived experience of NAN community members and how they are shaped by the current housing system. This requires a continuing shifting of understanding of what is housing and how much more than shelter housing must be. Our learnings include design, governance, administration, access to services, growth planning, and many other topics. While existing programs look to silo each of these, they must be dealt with holistically as part of an interconnected system in order for impact to be effective. So how do we apply these lessons? While there are things that can be accomplished at the individual or community level, many challenges and barriers are ingrained in the current systems. First Nations need control, not through an underfunded devolution of responsibilities, but giving us the ability to plan and move forward without community imposed barriers. There have been great efforts to move us from the north. And if anything, we must accept that a paradigm shift is needed. We are staying. Things need to be built to be permanent and to the same or higher standards as the rest of Canada. Advocacy will always be a key part of our work as we push forward on multiple fronts and projects. Recognition of housing as a right. Everyone has the right to safe and adequate housing. Secure housing has a variety of forms, not all pathways and in home ownership. Reliable and consistent funding. Adequately funded, adequately fund housing to reflect true costs in the North and the remote north. Remove competition between First Nations for housing funding. 
self-determination to build own housing systems. Support local governance. Build capacity in and between nations using existing strong relationships. Support local construction and labor to stop economic leakage. Culturally appropriate homes are built to support the growing population. So when we consider this vision for the future that Mike just shared with us, all of those elements are pieces that are part of the Anishinaabeaski Nation housing strategy uh, that rely to think on that vision and reflect and uh, write policy notes, uh, share different types of academic and as well as policy notes to government officials and advocating for change. We do all of this through partnership. It's important to note that this relationship has been built over the last four years. While relationships are central to the way we work and the outcomes we produce, it means taking time to do the work in a good way. It does mean to think about self-reflection, examining your own worldview, building long-term relationships that take a lot of time and trust, to center community voices and seek out a diverse perspective, and to understand that it's an iterative process and that we need to listen, learn, and share. And I would encourage you to think about this is our way of being, that how we developed through this partnership that we call it the listen, learn, share model. As many of you are architects and planners, we need to partner in good ways. Again, to think about moving away from the translation of our worldview and knowledge systems that have been part of our education and recognize limitations of our profession and the potential to re-entrench harmful power dynamics and in turn to reflect on it and to think about what the histories of our professions have built and how we can do things in a good way. So many of you may be thinking, well, I don't work with Anishinaabeaski Nation or directly with the First Nation, but there are many things that you can do to support the work of ourselves and other people that are trying to change policy and make change uh, in Canada. Some of these suggestions I would encourage you to think about allowing Indigenous voices to lead, to listen to and amplify Indigenous voices recognizing that self-determination is critical to housing systems change. You can even do this in your next meeting. Walk in with more questions and not be thinking about what you want to say next, to truly listen and to listen to the voice and, and amplify marginalized voices in the room. To design with care. Use design processes to communicate value and dignity, designed for people and the place and ensure that you're thinking about holistically of how a community can benefit from these long-term projects and planning. And to think about the maintenance, the long-term uh, pieces of how people will work within them. To also examine your own worldviews, be open-minded, encourage yourself, allow yourself to be uncomfortable and to sit in that and consider why you're feeling that way and what this may say about your own worldview. To remember that your education and upbringing embody your worldview and it is not the only one. To be respectful and mindful. Keep in mind it's a circular process, listening, learning, and sharing that must be approached with respect and mindfulness in how you are communicating with Indigenous communities and other marginalized groups. Self-reflection requires checking your own assumptions and making sure Indigenous voices are centered, not your own, and do not paternalize those you are working with. We are all benefactors and contributors in partnership. And last, to think about listening, learning, and sharing. What, how you learn with others to create mutually reinforcing deep working relationships. We'd like to thank you and also to direct you to one of our recent articles we published together called What is Measured Defines the Crisis uh, that's in Plan Canada. Uh, it's work that came out directly of the Anishinaabe Asking Nation Housing Strategy uh, that really look to redefine that what people are measuring reflects um, our housing systems um, in the Anishinaabe Aski Nation uh, and that those metrics can begin to help to change policy and the funding structures around them. We want to thank you very much for joining us and we're welcome to being uh, contacted uh, through our emails and at the same point in time direct you to the Anishinaabe Aski Nation resources and then housing strategy for all of the newsletters the go back to community members, the policy reports, um, our latest um, response to the national housing uh, strategy to think about uh, First Nations and the First Nations approach. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Sheila, uh, Mike, I really want to thank you for uh, just an amazing presentation. Very thorough. I was completely struck by the 